So, hi, welcome to the VFX Artist Podcast. This week we have Maria Carriero. Hi, guys. Lead CG artist at Freefrog. <laughs> so, um, tell us a bit about yourself and, uh, and what you do. Yeah, well, I'm Maria. I am currently working at Freefrog. I'm a lead, uh, lead generalist, I guess you could say. I've been there for four or five months now, but I guess uh, I should start where at the beginning. <laughs> uh, I'm from I'm from Mexico, so I went to school and to uni there. Uh, I did um, like a media design, so it was like a graphic design with a little bit of 3D. But uh, when I got into my 3D classes, I realized that's what I wanted to do. So I found a school in LA called Nomad School of Visual Effects. And uh, yeah, I decided to pack my bags and go there for two more years. And uh, yeah, it was it was amazing. It's such a good school. I, I really recommend it. Um, it's been going, I think it just turned 25 years now. It's, it's one of the pioneers in VFX, I guess. It, you can still get their tutorials online. Like You don't have to go to the school, but yeah, so good. And um, I got my first job in LA thanks to my teachers at Norman. Um, one of them was working at Sayoc, Stephen Delala, who doesn't work there anymore, but he was my lighting teacher. And um, I guess I did a good enough job that he recommended me for an internship. And yeah, it was great. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I got to work on some cinematics and just some commercials. So that's kind of how I got my foot in the door. So when was this, Maria? This was... Oh, God. Uh, I'm in the industry seven years now. So this was... Uh, after I graduated, so maybe 2015, more or less? Right, 2000, 2015, maybe? Yeah, yeah, something like, something like that, I can't remember, sorry. But but yeah, I started at Sayup. that was my, my first official job um, as an intern. And then when that internship ended, another one of my teachers at Norman recommended me for a position in digital domain. Um, so I, I went there as well for a freelance project for, uh, it was a commercial for a collaboration with Ferrari and fancy watch uh, brand called Float. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of it before, but very expensive watches, but it was, it was really nice. Uh, I got to work with industry veterans and just learn from the, from the very best. So yeah, it was amazing. Um, it's an interesting place to work, uh, uh, but yeah, really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. So, because we so we met at the mill yeah. in London and like a, a, a while ago. So I was just wondering, how, what was your journey from LA? So you've gone from Mexico to LA. Yeah. And then did you go straight to the UK after LA, or did you work in other studios in LA, or did you work in somewhere else? Or? Yeah. So I finished school and then I worked in LA for two years, I believe. Yeah, two years. Um, then I moved to New York after DD, I went back to Syrup because, you know, like visas and all that in the US as a Mexican, uh, it's not that easy. Yeah. So Syrup knew me a bit better. They offered me a one year visa. So I stayed with them. And then, um, you know, Trump started and uh, Brexit had just happened. So I knew that if I wanted to stay in the US, it would be a bit harder. So I kind of needed to do a jump. Uh, to the UK before they changed the rules because oh sorry something I didn't mention is I'm Mexican Spanish as well so I have a Spanish passport which allows me to work uh. in the UK at that time before Brexit happened so because it had happened but they hadn't changed the rules yet I managed to move and did an interview with the mill and uh, thankfully they hired me <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so that was five years uh, and a bit ago so yeah that's kind of how I started here <laughs> really cool so have you always worked in commercials yeah i did a little bit of cinematics um and a little bit of film but like not a lot it was more like helping at dd or at Sire and at the mill when something came up that they needed help with um but i really wanted to work on long form so on film or episodic because i had been working in commercials for so long and uh, it is cool you do learn a lot in commercials and i would recommend it for anyone that is starting because it's so fast-paced and you get to do uh, a lot of workflows and put on a lot of different hats that you you really become a better artist uh, but i kind of had had enough of commercials and wanted to try it my mm -hmm. Uh, my skills in like a film or episodic sort of workflow, so that's why I ended up moving to Freefall. So 
So, yeah, that's what I could do. <laughs> Brilliant. Can you talk about what you're working on? I guess you're still under NDA at the moment. Yeah, so. I mean, we actually just uh, finished recently a project for Netflix. It's called Winx. Uh, so it was just released on Friday. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> but Not yet, but we'll check it out. Yeah, it's... um. It's kind of like a teenager or a young adult farm based. It's, I guess the the easiest way to explain it would be like Harry Potter, but instead of wizards, they are fairies, and it's, <laughs> it's they go to this fairy school, and there's like a lot of magic effects, and you know, like monsters, and it gets pretty dark, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's an interesting show. It was uh, it was really cool to be part of it, so. So yeah, I'm excited to, to see it. <laughs> cool. And so as a as a um, as a leader, you're managing a team of artists at Free Folk? Yeah, so Free Folk is quite small, so it's been an interesting dynamic. Um, and since I came into the project where it had already started, I was more like co leading, I guess you could say, because there was a lead already on it and he kind of took me under his wing and to show me their pipeline and their workflows and I was involved on it um, I guess as a co-lead I would say so I would I would give my comments with fresh eyes because I came in when they had been working on it for eight months or so um, and also did some shots of my own so that was really cool because uh, I'm a lead but I'm still an artist at heart so I, I just still love to work on the box. <laughs> You got to stay on the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to get really bored if I have to tell people what to do, and you know, like I feel like <laughs> as an artist, you kind of still want to practice your skills and get in there, leave a little bit of you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what what's your tool of choice? Is it uh, Houdini? Yeah, so Houdini, and I guess Maya. But these past two, three years, I've been uh, shifting my workflow to Houdini because uh, I believe it's more of the future of the effects, and it's a lot more interesting to work with. Uh, than Maya nowadays, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, that's been my my weapon of choice. <laughs> Did you find the transition easy or difficult? Is it was it particularly challenging? No, it it was it's quite different to Maya. I guess um, they all do the same thing, but you just have more tools in Houdini. I would say um, uh, it's a different way of thinking because it's node based. Uh, and it's non destructive, which is why I like the most about it. You know, like you have your notes and your chain of notes, and you can always change something. You never really, I think you could break it, but you can always trace it back to where it broke and fix it. And sometimes Maya is more like a closed box. If something breaks, it takes a, a little bit more. You start again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I really like Houdini. I would recommend anyone that is starting in the industry to definitely. Um, start learning it if they haven't already. Cool. So um, as a generalist, what sort of tasks are you mostly doing? Uh, yeah, oh, that's why I love being a generalist because you do a little bit of everything. So um, you usually get involved since pre-production, well, at least as a lead. So you get scripts, uh, you help on the bid, and you more or less see what um, the effects needs you're going to have and see what kind of artists are you going to need to tackle it. Um, so I guess you, you would usually start in assets. So I love asset building. I guess that's how I started, although I turned into a generalist. So modeling, sculpting, texturing, loop dev, room, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I guess you would uh, move into lighting as a generalist because uh, I guess you also have reading and animation and all that, but I don't consider that a generalist sort of skill. I feel mm. like it's too specialized. <laughs> yeah, you should leave it to the professionals. Um, so I guess you move into lighting afterwards and then do a little bit of slap comps uh, to help comp um, understand what you were trying to do in lighting. You know, like you have some special passes or IDs or whatever you you have put in your scene to kind of help comp make the effect be better. Uh, so yeah, that's I don't know if that answers, answers the question. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, did, did you find that actually because you use Nuke for slap comps, did that make it easier to transition to Houdini? Just using? Um, yeah, I guess it's it's similar idea of like it's node based. Um, of course, one is 2D, one is 3D, or I guess you could do a little bit of 3D in Nuke. But, but yeah, it is a similar way of looking at it. 
just gets a bit more complex. I'm not the best comper, so I don't know. I'm mm. sure you could get a lot crazier than you if you wanted to. But but yeah, it's similar way of thinking. It's just everything's not based. You can always go back or you know duplicate a whole branch and do something else. Stuff like that. And um, I know you've moved everything to Houdini. Is even even modelling and and you were talking about modelling and texturing the asset build. Are you still doing that in Houdini as well and sculpting and things like that? Um, it it depends on the asset. Uh, so I still feel like hard surface modelling in Maya is a little bit better. Maybe it's because that's where I learned it and uh, it's pretty robust of what you can do and it's quite easy. Um, you can do the same in Houdini, but it would mean learning certain tools that I haven't bothered learning. I kind of focus more on my Houdini side on like the procedural modeling of things, which you can't really do in Maya. Uh, so like saying little procedural models that you know will help you in like a bigger scope project. So like, um, I don't know, like variations on, on little houses or, uh, you know, like a, a bridge, um, it's just it's so fast you can literally do anything that your mm. skills allow you to and it's still something that I'm learning uh, but yeah to your answer I still model mostly on Maya unless it's more procedural modeling which I'm still kind of learning how to do and then sculpting I would I would keep the sculpting at least the more high-end sculpting in ZBrush um, and if it's like a quick sculpting I, I would do it in Houdini like a terrain or like just little little things that you kind of need to lay down. But if it's like very high res, I would definitely separate. So I guess that's why I'm a journalist because I just like all the different tools and yeah. Absolutely. I think that's much harder. One thing, I mean, with um, as a compositor, I had to learn Shake. I learned After Effects and then I learned Shake and then I learned Nuke. But that's over like 12 years. I've only, and I've obviously only really used one at a time. I never have to like bounce between them. Whereas I feel like as a generalist, you constantly have to add add another software, even if it's just a renderer, you know, yeah. even if it's just moving from like Mantra to Arnold or Arnold to Unreal, or, you know. Yeah, yeah, it keeps it keeps changing. Um, so I guess you have to keep edu educating yourself uh, and try not to be left behind. Because I guess something I have noticed in the industry is um, maybe industry veterans are a bit more reluctant to pick up new tools but when I talk to students um, they're very keen to learn and I love seeing that uh, like for example we were interviewing for a position at Freeport and I was so surprised and so happy to see that uh, this artist was uh, starting to learn Solaris and um, just uh, picking up new workflows in Houdini that, that the industry hasn't really moved forward on yet because I guess it's so hard to implement in new pipelines that uh, it really takes a few years to, to bring in new workflows. So, yeah, I, I try to to keep learning and to grab uh, whatever new software, like watching tutorials as, as much as I can and talking to students because they always bring in something fresh uh, from the industry, you know. It's, it's just cool. To see. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. So are you... Um, are you getting in? Are you find yourself getting involved with some of the recruitment process now? I mean, obviously you've only just started free folk, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I've actually I'm very happy. I've been um, um, fortunate enough to to help on that. So we were running an, an internship scheme called Future Folk. So I I interviewed some people along with the head of CG, um, our recruiter. Uh, so we went through all the reels and just really found one person we found two one was for 2d so i didn't select the 2d person um but we got an effects artist in to work on our project so that was yeah that was really cool and um cool yeah sorry so as someone that reviews reels and has actually had to select people what advice would you give um for people show reels for generalists and effects artists yeah, um, I would say obviously put your best stuff at the start. Uh, specify what you did on it because sometimes these are group projects, and I found that I would see the same shots on different reels because these were people from the same schools, but I didn't know what part they did on that project specifically. So 
uh, put your best stuff at the start because uh, sometimes they're so long I had to watch like hundreds of them so I couldn't sit down and see every single piece so put your most impactful shot at the start specify what you did what software did you use uh, what render um, and I guess that would be it and maybe if you're applying for a certain company say you really like ILM or something I would say care to them uh, if you can um, so show stuff that they could use in their production so if you like sculpting more like Disney character stuff or very stylized stuff I wouldn't necessarily send it to ILM you know so send stuff to the studio that you're applying to that makes the most sense maybe that means having different videos um, to send to but I, I think that works better you know if it's a feature animation studio don't send um, more VFX stuff you know just be a bit more um, make it more make it make more sense please. Yeah, yeah make it keep, keep it targeted and also yeah. like um, commercials and and feature films obviously yeah yeah I mean different I guess commercials um, you apply the same skill set so it's this, it's a shorter time frame, and you always have like a, I guess, a product to to sell or an experience or something the commercial is for. But the skills are the same, um, so yeah, I, I would say the reels could be similar. That's interesting because it, it used to be a big barrier, but I think that was also partly because of um, standard definition. Yeah, there's some commercials nowadays that are just blew me, blow me away. They're so amazing and like the quality honestly is on par to some of the effects heavy shots in some movies, you know, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when, so with, with the internship, so you've obviously, you were an intern yourself and you're, you're dealing with interns now. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to people that are at an internship or at a sort of some kind of apprentice or training role? Um, I would say be very open and willing to learn, which I think is quite obvious, but, um, you know, just ask the dumb questions. It doesn't matter. I'd much rather have an intern ask me questions nonstop than to sit there being too scared to ask me what to do or if they don't understand something on the pipeline or uh, you know like uh, something on their shot is broken or they didn't quite understand the uh, the task that I've given them I'd much rather have uh, the intern just ask um, so that and I I guess um, showing progress so if you're an intern probably your lead is going to ask you how you're doing at the end of the day and like what have you been up to and all that but I guess just showing showing your process how how you start with the task um, and what you can show at the end of the day. I think that would be probably my advice. But yeah, just yeah, brilliant. I mean, I've I had a similar as a leader. I had an experience where I, they weren't even trainees; they were sort of mid. But I might suggest a technique, and they obviously weren't familiar with it. But rather than saying "What do you mean?", they've just gone, "Oh yeah, I'll do that." And then I've seen the next version. They they haven't done it, and they probably didn't know what it was. So. Mm -hmm. And it, it is that fear. Like, no one knows everything. All of these tasks are so big. I mean, even 2D, which is, I think, not anywhere near on the level of the, the level of breadth of knowledge that you require as a 3D generalist. No, no one knows all of it. Yeah. And so when you come to Houdini and then you put in 2D, uh, Houdini and ZBrush and Maya together, possibly, plus a renderer or two renderers, and some of the renderers might be quite new, like Solaris, then, <laughs> I mean, people just need to ask questions and, and not stop. Yeah. And I think that's true for seniors as well. I know. And like, I, I also like checking in with, with interns and just seeing what new tools have they learned and like what skills they have that I don't probably have, you know, because they're fresh out of school. They probably had had more time to see tutorials and like see a video in class or something. So there's always something to learn from each other. So... I find that really cool and very interesting. So. I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, as a student, you have this opportunity um, to really dive deeply into into the latest and greatest. And in production, you just have to kind of use the thing that you know is going to work because you can't risk not delivering. 
Yeah. But as a student, you should definitely not be afraid to experiment. And, yeah, you know. I guess the stakes are not that high when you, it's a school project, but if you have like a movie or a commercial to deliver, you can't really change your pipeline halfway. You can't really test the new tool that came out or the new render or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like talking to students because they always uh, have a new, fresh eyes on what's new and exciting. Sometimes we often get very focused on the tools and the software, but apart from the actual software itself and the tools, what kind of qualities do you think make people better um, 3D artists? Mm, I say just be nice and easy to work with. Like It sounds so obvious, but uh, you can be the best artist, but if you're just not nice to be around people or not, going to hire you they're not going to recommend you for a job uh the amount of jobs i've, I've gotten just because people tend to like me and they recommend me and they, i can back it up with my work i guess that's uh, that's quite important so and it's the same if i know of a great artist that is also really nice to work with of course i would recommend them you know so i would say that um not being um kind of selfish with knowledge like i've i've seen sometimes in studios where an artist maybe has like a really interesting workflow and they're kind of i i, I don't want to say selfish but yeah selfish like they kind of guard that knowledge just like oh i want to share this because then you're not going to know this way of doing it and uh, i'm not going to be special anymore but i feel like if you can make production better and you've built a tool or you learn a new workflow sharing is always most good and you know, like uh, if you share your knowledge, you're probably going to receive something back as well eventually. So I would say that be nice, share your knowledge, uh, and just trying to keep learning. Um, as you said, there's just always new tools, new softwares, something to learn. So don't just sit there and get comfortable because you already have a job and you know what to do. You know, just keep studying. Um, read all the articles, watch tutorials, you know, stuff like that. That's brilliant. I think with regarding sharing, I'd say another aspect to that um, is always reward the person who shares. I mean, always like, you know, say, yeah, Maria Cariello showed me this, this great new workflow in Houdini that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it's, it's a minor thing, but I think it, one, it gives them that immediate benefit, but it kind of, encourages more people to share maybe those that are being selfish and they see someone getting you know big ups and kudos and maybe even job job recommendations or promotion recommendations because of stuff they're sharing yeah that might encourage them even if they're purely acting from self-interest to just also share their tools <laughs> yeah of course um, i think i think that's pretty crucial but i mean you'd be surprised by uh, some people just really guard their secrets <laughs> I don't think it makes any sense as well because I mean, what happens if if they come in if they're sick one day or or they they go on holiday for two weeks and you know their shot can't be moved forward, yeah. um, or or it has to be redone because maybe they've done what they've done is perfectly fine, but because no one else knew what they were doing or nobody knew knew how to do it, mm -hmm. they just had to use a different workflow and then suddenly, whatever special source they'd added is lost in the final shot that goes on the show. Yeah, I guess that it, it, it takes some time sometimes to, to pick up someone's shot and like, trying to see what they were doing and the process. And you, you learn from picking up other people's shots, but sometimes, yeah, it's uh, you kind of need them right next to you to kind of explain what they were doing. Are you working all in the office or are you working from home or is it a mixed workflow? Uh, it's a hybrid workflow, although right now we are moving offices, so I'm working from home. Um, every day until November. Because we were in Wardour Street, so right across of NPC. Uh, but we're moving to Spitalfields area. In a, it's a really cool office, but it's a listed building. And uh, you know uh, all the rules with historic buildings that it needs to be very well taken care of. I think there's like hand digging because they can't get machines in and like stuff like that. So mm. just delayed a bit our, our office. Um, but yeah, in theory, we should be there in November. And, uh, we, yeah. So, are there any particular advice when you are working from home, when you're not direct in direct contact people, of maintaining communication and, and keeping things moving that are unique to work from home? Yeah, so we always do uh, what we call rounds in the morning. So you 
you log in, you show you at 9, and then maybe we do around 9.30 to kind of get people some time to grab some coffee or whatever. And rounds is just to say hello and see what you uh, what you're supposed to tackle that day. So say like, hey, uh, Dan, are you working on this shot? What are you going to do today? Uh, okay, cool. And then you just give us uh, the plan for the day of what what you're going to do, and then you check in again later in like a dailies, for example. So you've already been working part of the day. You, you submit whatever you've had to dailies, and then you review it all together. So it's kind of two calls maybe to um, chat with people and make sure everyone is on track uh, when you're not working together. I think that's pretty important. And then, uh, yeah, just chat individually if something comes up with your lead or if you want to chat with another artist about a specific show, asset or whatever. So, yeah. Um, I think with uh, with management that I find with 3D, especially some of the more advanced Houdini stuff, um, in terms of, is it's quite hard to assess progress. I mean, it's much easier in comp. You can see if this shot is better, this key is better, you know, mm. everything sort of is, is advancing even if it's still a whip. But sometimes in Houdini, there could be a lot going on and you don't necessarily see a lot happening. <laughs> For a while. Yeah, it, it takes a while. It's all a process. So, for example, maybe in r and stages where you're just figuring out how you would get certain effect or how are you going to do certain thing. Um, I guess it's the, it's the slowest stage because you're really setting everything up. Uh, like our last project at the mill together, uh, I can't mention what it was, but there were a lot of trees, if you remember. <laughs> or effects on trees. Yeah. So just, um, I mean, I didn't do the tree setup. That was uh, our amazing effects artist. But just seeing that iteration with the effects on the trees and how they were going to move and like, it took so long. But once you get to that stage where you can use all the R&D that you've used and uh, really see it on the shot, it starts making more sense. And then with uh, comp magic, it starts looking pretty. Because <laughs> at the very start, it, nothing looks that nice it really needs that final uh beauty pass and all that magic that comp artists do so it's all collaborative effort so so yeah the start maybe looks like nothing is happening but it, it's very important steps to kind of troubleshoot what you can or you can't do with the, the task that you that you have so yeah <laughs> it's amazing how much r&d we have to do isn't it because it, there are no two shots that are exactly the same there's always this Oh, how do I do this? <laughs> Even if you've done it for years and you've done similar things, but there's always, like you say, I've done smoke before, but now there's smoke in trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's always uh, something different. And like, I mean, I guess you can't recycle some setups from uh, another job and, you know, tweak it to make it fit this other job. But there's always some time that you're going to have to just sit down and put your thinking cap and see what you, how you're going to do this one. Um, and yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> To me, it's my, my favorite part, actually, r and because it's really troubleshooting and seeing what helps and what doesn't. And it's a lot of learning also. You pick up some really cool techniques in this stage. So, yeah, I, I love this part of the project. But also, once you see it come together and making it look pretty, it's just oh, so satisfying. It's satisfying, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what you kind of always want to be at the beginning and the end, I think. The least satisfying yeah. is when you're just in the middle of lots of projects. That can be a little bit frustrating because you've neither had the fun of the R&D nor are you getting to see how good it can look at the end. Yeah, exactly. You just see all the stuff that you have to do. It can be a bit discouraging, but, you know, it's a part of the project. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the job. I mean, yeah. it is also a job. We get paid to do it. So <laughs> yeah, you get all this cool, fun stuff, but you've got to do some other stuff as well. Yeah. Um, what about, um, uh, what is your approach to reference? So with something very particular, like a very particular, um, look, what, what is your, what is your sort of go-to in terms of finding reference and, and getting that sort of ready and, and sharing it? Yeah, I guess, um, it depends on a project, but you can find reference from everyday life, you know, like you're just going for a walk, taking pictures of whatever you see in especially if it's nature reference um it's it's all around you or trying to replicate replicate um 
reality. So of course, uh, if you notice something interesting, interesting like a tree growing a certain way or like a interesting ground texture, like it's always good to take pictures. So that's a good one. Um, I'm not an animator, but for example, if if you were taking video of yourself trying to act something or like just finding online reference of what you're trying to replicate. Um, as a generalist, I guess um, assets, sometimes I don't have access to them. So of course online, I, I try to find them in picture videos, whatever I can get my hands on. And uh, I mean, as, as you're aware, we do magical worlds sometimes of things that don't exist. So trying to find reference of that uh, can be quite challenging. But of course, you can always refer to other VFX shots, um, uh, I don't know, what, whatever inspires you really, if it's like a magic, like the show that we, we finished, which is like fairy, some fairy magic, I guess, nothing is really real, so <laughs> whatever looks pretty and whatever inspired you, you can, you can always just sneak something in there, so, yeah. And um, what about... Because obviously we don't get always the final say on, on how things look. What is your way of working with um, notes or preparing for notes in advance? Yeah, that, that was always challenging. I guess you you always try to hit the brief um, in the way that client uh, is expecting you to. So trying to be clear with what you were given. Um, like we sometimes start to present different options. Um, you don't want to flood the, the client with options either, but uh, I guess you try to present two or three different options of what your vision could be, and then hopefully they go with the one that you like the most, but that's not how it happens <laughs> sometimes. Um, but yeah, in the end, you're making a product, so you have to please the client uh, that you're making things for, so you kind of have to detach yourself a little bit from the final product. And, I, and of course, the secret, um, I guess, the link between you and the client is, is production. Um, as an artist, what what do you consider makes a good producer? Um, oh, this one, this one's tricky because I've had some amazing producers and I've had some, you know, not so great. <laughs> um, but I would say a producer that is on your side, on the artist side, is always... Um, I mean, obviously, I'm the artist, right? Well, or one of the artists, but sometimes, at least in commercials, uh, you see some producers that try to maybe pander to client a bit too much or be too agreeable with uh, maybe client requests that are, are outside the budget or like moving deadlines forward and just things that screw your artist over. So I would say taking care of your artist first, uh, that would be great for a producer. Of course, uh, taking notes in uh, meetings. I have producers that uh, don't take notes for some reason, and I end up doing part of the job. <laughs> uh, that was a long time ago, though. Um, what else would be uh, just keeping track of things? Because sometimes, as a as a lead, you have to keep track of so many other things in your own end. That is good to have someone that uh, knows at what stage we're at, when is the next deadline. Uh, what we're supposed to send, you know, that, that sort of thing, so, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and since we've gone through a lot of, we've talked a lot about different techniques and softwares and so on, um, I was wondering what you thought are likely to be the up-and-coming sort of workflows or tools that uh, aren't necessarily already in pipelines. Yeah, so, so for example, as I was uh, talking before, Houdini releasing Solaris and Karma. I think that's uh, going to be amazing. Also the use of USD pipeline. Um, but I, have, I haven't I have seen um, uh, a studio yet using it fully. I have heard of some studios trying to implement it, but like halfway through a production and it really backfiring, so then having to go back on whatever they were doing before. But I think that's the, the way forward. Um, I'm very keen to see how it moves and uh, how studios uh, use their current pipelines and move to the next thing. Um, I think, well, Maya is still very much in use, but I think uh, I'm seeing more people move towards Houdini uh, for 
which is basic lighting rendering and shading. Um, what else? On real, I don't use Unreal uh, yet, but I think it's going to be. It's already very um, widespread, widespread use, but I think um, I think they're going to use it more. Like for example, we're seeing it more in virtual production and uh, pre-production. So a lot of previous being done in Unreal, I think that's really interesting because mm. sometimes you have clients that are not like VFX savvy, and when you show them some previous. Uh, like the traditional previous that is just maybe done in like Maya viewport, it all looks quite ugly. So, it, and it's not animated properly, nothing has like nice textures, it's not really rendered. So, sometimes it's hard for some people to understand what they're looking at. But um, if you show them something more in real where it's like a bit more polished and you have better quality, I think that helps. Uh, for a client to kind of understand what's going on. Yeah. And using it helps to make up their mind earlier. Yeah, and like using it also in, uh, in virtual production. So building uh, your previous world and then taking that on shoot and uh, placing your cameras um, according to the world that you're building and not just trying to put your subject on like a green or blue screen and not really having an idea of what's going to be behind them. I think that's really cool and it's really opening a whole world of possibilities for like um, Unreal and VFX and us working together. I think eventually it's going to merge and uh, it, it will probably be a real-time render in the end, but uh, I, don't, I don't think we're there yet. I think we're a good 10 years from us, but <laughs> we'll see. And we've been kind of talking about real-time render since I started. I think it's always been the idea, yeah. but it still seems to be one hour per frame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you still have to amazing. render it in the end. It's real-time, but not really. I mean, you still have to render it in the end if you want to use it for, you know, the effects. But in the side for pre-production and uh, uh, virtual production, I think it's amazing. And it's, it's already merging that gap that we've had before, so... I think it also really help actors uh, when they're in a green screen studio. Like I don't know if you, you've seen. Um, I think it was the production of The Hobbit when Sir Ian McKellen was a bit. Um, I think he got a bit frazzled because he was acting on his own in this like green screen room, and he was like, "Oh, this is not acting. This is not what I signed up for." Or, I'm not really sure what went down, but I think if the actors at least knew what was supposed to be behind them and like had a little bit more to work with. I think that would really <laughs> help everyone. So yeah, yeah, no, it, it definitely. And DOPs is well, also camera and DOPs. I mean, I, I don't know. As I often see a lot of shots where they're just framed incorrectly because the camera pro has obviously framed the art, the 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 performers who are in shot. Yeah. And there's something very important that should be in shot, or perhaps they're focused on the actor because the thing that should probably be in focus is doesn't exist mm -hmm. so or they don't want to have the whole shot out of focus because it looks wrong to them right of course but in reality they're putting uh, something in effects that's here <laughs> and that should be in focus and not the actor so i think also uh, people talk about the actors obviously because they're the famous ones but i think also for camera camera and lighting even light at the gaffer you know when they put where they put their key you know where they set up the lights or yeah things like that i mean it can really really help yeah it's crazy um it's all merging. what are you learning at the moment what am i learning oh god I, I keep trying to learn things um well as i was telling you i've been the past two years or so i've made my transition to hootie um so i've been trying to get better vex which is the the coding language inside hootie uh which can get so complex and like the, all the geniuses that work at NFX, uh, they blow my mind, like all the maths and all that stuff. So I'm just trying to learn a snippet of it to make my job a bit easier on some things. So I've been learning that. Uh, Carmen Solaris. Um, what else? Uh, I think that's it at the moment. Uh, I mean, that's plenty, really. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's ever looked at Houdini knows that that's plenty. Um, what, we talked about your early education, just to give you an idea. What kind of things were you strongest at school were you more sort of an arty person more of a math science person um that's an interesting question i guess uh i had always had a terrible memory so anything that was remembering things so like history or geography all that stuff i was terrible at but um maths i was actually pretty good at 
and um, drawing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else I was good at? Um, and I guess philosophy. Those were like my top marks, which is really a weird combination. But I guess it explains also uh, the effects. It's that, that perfect combo of artistic and technical, so, which I, I guess is why I ended up doing what I do. So, you know, I have the, the technical brain, which is, it's, you know, sufficient to do what I do. And then uh, the artistic side of me, that uh, it's also something that you have to keep nourishing and just uh, get better at your arts and, you know, never stop creating on your own. <laughs> I mean, the philosophy sounds oddball, but I think anyone that's actually worked in production will realise that if you're able to express ideas, complex ideas, clearly, then that's a really important skill. I guess. I don't know if I'm explaining these, these podcasts all right. I, I'm going to blame it on the uh, language barrier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really feel any language barrier, um, if I'm honest. Okay, if okay. I'm ever struggling, it's actually because I have a really bad headphone. So I'm sort of sometimes you... <laughs> I, anyone watching the podcast on YouTube will see me sort of leaning that way, and that's just yeah. because um, I lost the cable to my good headphones. Oh and no! I need really to get a new one. one. I have this one. Right? It's like <laughs> yeah. I'm selling you something like a new set of. Oh, I have great! Podcasts. I have great um, Bluetooth headphones, but um, I when I when I use them for the podcast, I have a cable, uh, and I'm, you know how it is. You always find that you have cables that are just not quite the right size. Oh, so. right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a bit of that. But it's been really amazing to finally get you, oh, thank you. Um, on the podcast. And so I would like to thank you again for coming on. Oh, and so we look forward to um, catching up with you again. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. And I hope you're doing well. <laughs>